hello, everybody. It's another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I'm with a wonderful, I'll say old friend, but neither one of us are old. It's that we've been <laughs> there for a long time, right? Um, um, we, we won't go there, but i um, so excited to be here with Dr. Jolene Brighton. I'll introduce her in just a second. We're going to talk about her new book, Is This Normal? And we're going to dive into some really practical questions and things. I love the cover, love the texture. <laughs> so, and I, I want to be sure and have it because my hair almost matches your book. <laughs> I know your hair is on fire, like oh. for real. <laughs> So super excited to have you here, Dr. Brighton. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's so good to see you. I feel like post-pandemic, like seeing people, like just seeing people is always like such a treat. Isn't it? I know even in my office, patients are starting to come in. I'm like, can I hug you? You know, like, yeah. you got to ask, can I touch? And can I, but it's so lovely to have that in-person connection. And same with, I know conferences are starting to um, come back and lately they've been uh, full of people. People are excited to mm-hmm. be person. Um, well, let me introduce you and then we'll dive right into this topic. Um, I titled it hormone balance for women, especially PCOS menopause and all things hormones. So, um, we're going to dive in. Dr. Jolene Brighton is a hormone expert, nutrition scientist, and thought leader in women's medicine. She's board certified in naturopathic endocrinology and trained in clinical sexology. Uh, Dr. Brighton is the author of, is this normal, a non-judgmental guide to creating hormone balance, eliminating unwanted symptoms and building the sexual desire you crave. A fierce patient advocate and completely dedicated to uncovering the root cause of hormonal imbalances, Dr. Brighton empowers women worldwide to take control of their health and their hormones through her website and social media channels. She's an international speaker, clinical educator, and medical advisor within the tech community. I am so happy to be here with you, talk about a topic that everybody has questions about. (laughs) Oh yeah, I can't wait to dive in. I mean, between TCOS, perimenopause, menopause woes, there's a whole lot of lack, there's a whole lot of like abyss out there, right? There's a big hole of information. Then there's a whole lot of misinformation as well. Yeah. I think what's happened is uh, in medicine, first of all, as medical doctors, we are not well trained on women's health, women's hormones, and some of these things. Now I've become kind of a hormonal expert and endocrine expert in my little field as well, but it's a lot of the education, especially with nutrients and herbs and in just even what's normal, what's not normal, which we're going to dive in today. A lot of that education was outside of medical school. And I say that because you go to your doctor, especially the classical allopathic trained doc, you're going to get blank stare or like, Oh, uh, maybe you need an antidepressant, like these things that are really insulting to women. Um, because yeah. now, even now, there is not the kind of education that we need. So this is such a needed resource. If you guys don't have a copy, go out right now and get your copy. It is just chock full. And what I love about this book, what you did, and I want to talk about how you got to write this book is it's so practical. You could just almost flip to any chapter, any place and be like, oh, okay, here's some questions. Are my hormones normal? Is menstrual cycle normal? And you've got it so well laid out to just be like, you can read through it and it's amazing Mm -hmm. that way. Or you can kind of flip to different topics and things. You've got checklists, you've got sidebars, you've got recipes and plans at the end. Tell us though, how did you, I mean, clearly there's a need for this information, but how did you go about deciding on this book? Oh, you know, there, it just became so clear as I wrote beyond the pill, that the reason that we find ourselves and to your point, you go to the doctor, doctor says, you know, okay, you, you're complaining you like, I have period problems. Your doctor says to you, well, do you want to have a baby? You say, no, they say, here's the pill. Mm -hmm. And you find yourself on that because you don't understand what's normal for you and what's not. And the majority of things that we face as women, like we don't have to go to the doctor for, or Our doctor doesn't even understand it. They don't even know about it. And especially all of the information about sexual health that I talk about in there. These are things that once I made ask Dr. Brighton on Instagram anonymous, that people were like, let me tell you the hush hush (laughs) that I would never say to my doctor or my doctor shamed me about. And so that was a big reason for that. And then, you know, the other thing I want to say is that you were talking, we're talking about menopause as well. So if you are in your reproductive years, they're going to say to you, take the pill. If you are in your later reproductive years, really edging towards menopause and you're having heavy periods, painful periods, they're going to say, just remove your uterus. And if you're having mood symptoms, we know that once we get into our forties and above women in the United States are the biggest recipients of antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, and things that come with really heavy side effects that are very often not discussed. I mean, 
We saw just a few years ago that women in their 40s were dying at a higher rate because doctors were prescribing benzodiazepines and not telling them that rosé all day and benzos don't go together or a little not mommy nightcap and benzos don't go together. And so we see it's really limited in what women are offered. And so I wanted to start the conversation about what is and is it normal when it comes to your vagina, your breasts, your hormones, how do we understand our normal and then give you a plan on taking action so that you can fast track your healing. So even if you need a doctor, you go to a doctor, you will have the language, the expertise, but also the foundation that supports your body so that you can heal quicker. Mm. Love it and so needed. And like um, we started this conversation, the traditional allopath is going to say um, this is dysfunction, but they're in the realm of normal, what is normal and what's yeah. normal? Like, <clears throat> say a woman in their menopause is having vaginal dryness and wants to have better sex without pain. Um, the doctor doesn't always have a good solution for that. And again, the pill is not going to help in many of these cases. It may make things worse. Let's talk about that real quick because whether you have yeah. PCOS or you're perimenopausal, um, or your postmenopausal, um, typically not postmenopausal, but a lot of these younger women are getting offered the pill. Why is mm-hmm. that a problem for some issues and not always a good idea? Yeah. Well, the problem with using the pill for every single lady part problem or hormone problem is that the question isn't being asked, why do you have those symptoms? That is in part leading to the misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis of very serious conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypothyroidism, fibroids. I mean, the the list is pretty broad in terms of endometriosis being another one of what gets overlooked or dismissed or doesn't get the attention it deserves. Now, the pill is a tool. We can certainly use that tool to manage symptoms. And that's what I think is an important part of the conversation. Often doctors will say, so PCOS as an example, just take the pill that will fix your period. In fact, what is going on with PCOS is that we have an ovulatory cycle. So we're not, we're not having ovulation or it's irregular ovulation. Ovulation precedes menstruation. So if you don't see a period, we've got upstream issues with ovulation. The pill suppresses ovulation fantastic. If you don't want a baby, like love that if you do not want to become pregnant, but in terms of fixing periods in a condition where ovulation is the issue, how can a drug that suppresses ovulation fix that? It can't. So then women come off of the pill. And one thing that will happen is they'll often look back and say, the pill caused me to be infertile. When Mm -hmm. in fact, the pill was masking all the ways your body was telling you, we're about to have fertility problems in our future. And it wasn't the pill per se that caused you to become infertile. It's that nobody worked you up for the PCOS. Nobody understood that TCOS, which is one of the top reasons why women struggle with fertility. No one understood that was the cause. No one talked to you about it. No one talked about the fact that there is insulin issues. About 70% of women with PCOS have insulin issues and there's inflammation going on as well. Those are also bad for fertility, but also cardiovascular disease, dementia, all of these things. So that's the problem with the pill. When we give it without a discussion, when we give it without an informed consent, and when we give it without actually asking, why does this patient have these symptoms? Because certainly for some people, the pill can help with acne. It can help with, some people it helps with hair loss, some people it makes hair loss worse. Some Mm -hmm. people it does help them get relief from their period or PMDD, which if Mm -hmm. people are not familiar with that, I always say take PMS, now amplify it by a million. It's the worst it could possibly be. And then stretch it out for two weeks out of the month or six months out of the year. And you've arrived at PMDD. Some people are absolutely helped by taking the pill. But that is not the end of the discussion. And to your point about perimenopause, we don't, <clears throat> we have a lot better ways, right? To treat perimenopause and to help with those symptoms. We don't have a whole lot of research supporting pill use as having the same benefits as bioidentical hormones or hormone replacement therapy in perimenopause. In fact, there was just a headline that came out and it was like, oh, you know, these hormones. these hormone replacement therapy, it could put you uh, like, and, and I'm a doctor. So I'm like, everything is very you know, I'm So I'm trying to be like, you could, yeah. or maybe no, the headline was like, you're going to get that. And when you actually looked at the research, they were using progestin 
The yes. majority yes. of people were using progestin. Progestin is the fake hormone yes. that, that wants to be progesterone, but can't be progesterone that we know is problematic. Progesterone nourishes the brain, the nervous system. It helps with the myelin sheath, which is like the way that we run and fire our neurons, our thoughts, the whole ability to talk. Like, thank you, myelin sheath. Progestin does not have those same benefits. And if everybody would just like chill on trying to regulate the pill and we could have yeah. real conversations about it, I think we would get more research and a deeper exploration that would tell us that there are in fact problems with progestin. And we see this by way of the research that shows us that some people experience mood symptoms, especially teens, um, when they're on contraceptives that have progestin or are progestin only. And that's important to understand. So if we know this in a younger population, like, and, and your mood is not separate from your brain. And this is sometimes doctors are like, there's two different things. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is the same, same. If we know that in a younger population, it should be no surprise that we see dysfunction, right? Mm -hmm. That's induced by a medication if we're using that progestin in an older demographic. Now we need a whole lot more research to understand all of the nuance of this, but you know, just want to say, as I use the term dysfunction, love it when there's a medication that comes in and, and makes you feel dysfunctional. Don't love it when we're having a physiological adaptation that is normal, that is a response to our environment. Yeah. And I just want to say that because we're going to talk about vaginal dryness and pain, pain with sex. And that often gets termed as like sexual dysfunction. And I'm like, well, it's actually physiological adaptation. Like yes. you don't want to have sex because it hurts. That's yes. normal. Yes. Yes. What a great, and right in the moment you said the headline, which is the one I, I know is out there, I think, and it, you cut out, I want to make sure people heard that. I think it was the uh, risk of um, Alzheimer's dementia with the hormones, right? The one that just came Absolutely. out. And just like you, I read that. I'm like, wait, this is literally our Bredesen group, which is all about dementia treatment. Um, was yeah. like, wait, this is progestins. This is not progesterone. So I love that you totally. made the distinction um, because with mental health too, we're finding that actual um, real hormones have been shown to benefit um, aging brains. So that is mm -hmm. absolutely clear, but not synthetic. So let's go back to PCOS. You are an expert yeah. in PCOS. I love that you talk about this because it is absolutely increasing incidence. You gave some symptoms, but let's just frame it. What might someone, what, what might a woman who has PCOS experience, how might they know? And then what are some ways to look at that um, besides giving them the pill? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there mm -hmm. is a criteria that has to be met with PCOS. And so these are the big ones. Number one is the polycystic ovarian syndrome that people think like you're going to have lots of cysts. This is not only always true, but it is part of the criteria. And in fact, what medicine once thought were like, oh, you have a bunch of cysts in your ovaries are actually follicles that mm -hmm. are developing. And it, through our cycle, we develop follicles and this is where the egg is housed. And then as you get closer to ovulation, there can be only one, one wins and, you know, estrogen, LH, the whole hormone symphony is like, choose your champion and let's release it with PCOS because we're not getting that same level of brain hormones and ovarian hormones what we see is that there's a lot of follicles trying to win the race and so that's what looks like the what will you know be termed like the pearl necklace mm -hmm. that appearance of a, a strand of pearls of a bunch of cysts in the ovaries not actually cysts your little ovaries trying so hard to get an egg ready and get to ovulation so that's that's one of the three criteria now you only need two and the other two are high androgens, which doesn't have to be diagnosed via blood work. This can be a clinical diagnosis. So you can have hirsutism, hair growth on the chin, chest, abdomen. This is not, um, I often get people who are like, or it's just your ethnicity. And I'm like, listen, I'm a Latina and I'm gonna tell you, this is not an ethnicity right. thing. You have very dark, coarse, thick hair, and it is showing up like a beard around your areola. It is showing up what people call the happy trail or even extending mm -hmm. down your thighs. Mm -hmm. And it is to the point where you're like, I notice, and this is problematic. Now you might not always have hirsutism. Maybe what you experience instead is hair loss on your head. Yeah. It starts with a miniaturization of the follicle. Mm -hmm. So DHT, which is the type of androgen that's causing our follicle to get really small. 
your strands of hair, they go from like, I think about like 1980s, like Superman. And they're like, oh, here's his strand of hair holding up this like big weight. Um, and I just dated myself, but that's okay. So your, your hair is getting weaker and thinner. It is not Superman anymore. That can be a sign of excess androgens and what most people think of as testosterone. Yeah. Oily skin and acne. Those mm -hmm. are two other really big ones. So that is the second out of the three criteria. And then the third is where is your period or your period shows up, but it's super unpredictable or it's going beyond 45 days. That is due to ovulatory issues. So we have irregular ovulation or lack of ovulation. So these are the things we're looking for with PCOS to make the diagnosis. Again, you need two out of three. It is a diagnosis of exclusion which means that if you just have an irregular period showing up, you need to make sure it's not hypothyroidism, that it's not something else going on. Now, things not talked about with PCOS and that aren't part of the diagnosis is that you can have high insulin levels. So you might notice that you have blood sugar dysregulation or that mm -hmm. you're having dark velvety skin. I talk about this and is this normal? That's showing up maybe on the back of your neck or in folds. Um, you're seeing this dark velvety skin or skin tags that can be a sign mm -hmm. of insulin resistance taking place. You may also notice that you have mood symptoms. So Anxiety, depression, very common among women with PCOS, often overlooked, often not, you know, something their doctor even talks to them about when they get the diagnosis. As you can imagine, if you are not ovulating re regularly, infertility, so inability to conceive is another way that, and it might be the first time you come off the pill that you start paying attention to that and you're like, something, something is going on here. And then the last thing I'll say is weight gain. And this is weight gain that no matter what you do, you can't seem to get the weight off. And, um, or maybe, you know, you're somebody who's like, I've been strength training yeah. and I'm very strong, but I'm noticing, especially around my midsection that I'm starting to gain weight. And as you know, you go to the doctor as a woman, if you complain about weight, they're like, eat less, move more. And I'm always like, you know, I actually said, and is this normal? Like that is some dietary dogma that yes. never should have been in women's medicine because it is such, it is such a disservice and such a tool of dismissal. Yeah. I, okay. Hey everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Yeah, I, I love that you say that because so many women are to told or, and this goes for PCOS, but also menopause, right? Because when we have cortisol and insulin that are higher than our yeah. hormones, or in fact, I just saw a diagram might've been even from you where the cortisol, insulin, high testosterone, medium, and estrogen, progesterone lower is the classical. I can't lose mm -hmm. for both PCOS and for menopause. So I love that you're saying this because truly the hormones are much more regulatory on our weight than our diet and exercise. Um, so thank you for framing that. So then women go to their doctor and they'll, and doc's like, okay, you want the pill. Why would they maybe not want to, we already framed this, but why would they maybe want to do something different and what else could they do if they're just diagnosed with PCOS besides going on the pill? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you can always use the pill, especially like I have patients who are like, I'm getting married. I need to have clear yeah. skin. Like yeah. I need interventions. And so I just want to say that because I think, um, it's There's really no shame easy. around that. I love that. No, and it's really easy for women who have never walked that path to be like, just never use the pill. And it's like, yeah, but you're about to memorialize an, a life event, a major life yes. event for the rest of your life. These photos will live on your wall. If you want to have clear skin, like totally yeah. get that. I think it's important for people to understand you can use the pill and use the nutrition and lifestyle interventions. You can use spironolactone and use the nutrition and lifestyle interventions. You can use metformin 
stats for your insulin and your blood sugar as a tool, well, you also build that foundation. And the, neither of those drugs that I just mentioned have to be with you forever. Yeah. And so you might want to use it. You're like short-term, I just need the results. And now I want, but I'm going to work on all this other stuff because I don't want to be dependent on those. So I do want to say that. So if you, wherever you are in your journey, what I'm going to explain to you, you can utilize and employ. So number one is build muscle mass. I think, um, so back when I was in my master's for nutrition, my research was on sarcopenic obesity. So for over 20 years, I've been like build muscle mass, yeah. everybody and eat adequate protein. Most people are going to need more like one gram per kilogram of body weight of protein to maintain muscle mass, especially as you get past 35. Super, super important. Now your muscle is in itself an endocrine tissue. It's going to help with sensitizing to in uh, insulin. It's going to help with modulating those estrogen and testosterone levels. So Although I talked about testosterone in PCOS, estrogen can also be problematic because estrogen is part of the let's get an egg out, but then it never happens. And without ovulation, we don't get progesterone. Yeah. So estrogen goes on unchallenged. So a lot of what people call estrogen dominance that mm -hmm. you'll see, I do have to just share it as an aside. I had someone on social media um, saying, oh, Dr. Brighton is the one who invented estrogen dominance and invented this term. And I just laughed because I was like, if you go to PubMed, there's research that yeah. says estrogen dominance that came out before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was not me. I just happened to be noisy about it. So with that estrogen excess, this is what puts women with PCOS at higher risk for endometrial hyperplasia, building up of the endometrial lining, and then that inability to shed, you go a year or two of that, you're going to start seeing your risk of endometrial cancer creep up. This is a reason a doctor will say, this is your only way to prevent endometrial cancer because you have PCOS and you're going to get that. Yeah. No, just because you have PCOS does not mean you will get endometrial cancer. And the pill is one tool that can trigger withdrawal bleed, make the endometrial lining shed. But what's our primary goal? let's get you to ovulating regularly. So building muscle mass is one thing that we can do. The other thing that we can do is work on our inflammation. So with inflammation, that is going to cause chaos for the adrenal glands. It's going to cause chaos for your estrogen testosterone balance. It is going to cause uh, chaos in terms of your ability to get back to ovulation. And when your cells feel that inflammation, they're not filling the hormones. So the receptors actually won't be as accepting to the hormones and you'll lose sensitivity that way as well. So that can look like, you know, keeping our stress low, doing our exercise, but also our dietary choices. So lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. And I don't care that you have PCOS eating fruits are going to, it's going to provide you with so many antioxidants. It's going to provide you with a lot of things that are supportive, not just for your overall health, but your ovarian health. I always tell patients like, look at berries. Do berries not look like an ovary, like really trying to like, it, it reminds yeah, me yeah. of like PCOS. Yeah, it it does. <laughs> and we know those antioxidants that are in berries are super beneficial for our ovaries. So making sure that you're getting fresh fruits and vegetables in as often as possible. If you got to do frozen, you got to do frozen. Yeah. Like that happens. I I'm like, fro like I'm where I'm at right now. The only way to get organic broccoli, which I eat a lot of, mm -hmm. um, is frozen. And yeah. you know what? I'm still going to get the dim. I'm yeah. still going to get the sulforaphane. I'm still going to get the nutrients. So in eating all those fruits and vegetables, you're not only going to deliver nutrients and building a nutrient dense diet, you're also going to be increasing your fiber. Yeah. So we want to aim for at least 25 grams of fiber. We know from the research. So even if you don't have PCOS, please listen up. Yeah. If you struggle with your weight at all, 25 grams of fiber every day, less than 25 grams added sugar every day. Okay. So less, less right better with the sugar, you want to get that fiber up and tending to your gut microbiome. So there's been research showing that microbial diversity in the gut, people mm -hmm. who have lots of critters in there and a lots of different kinds, they have lower incidences of belly fat and it's easier for them to ditch the belly fat. Now, why does this matter? For people listening, we're not talking about aesthetics. We're talking about visceral adiposity. When I say belly fat, 
when we're talking about fat packing around your organs, mm -hmm. it is pro-inflammatory. It hates, it hates you being sensitive to insulin because it just wants you to like, it just basically plump up those cells as much as possible. And that is the big risk for everybody in terms of cardiovascular and metabolic disease. So for everybody, tend to your gut health, eating all that fiber is going to help. You may want to take a quality probiotic and decreasing that sugar is definitely going to be helpful. And I know that the anti-diet culture, they're going a little too far, in my opinion, some of them, where they're like, anyone who talks about sugar is like, you know, part of the problem. And I'm like, friend, am I supposed to ignore all the research? Right. Am I supposed to lie to you? Because like the, the diet industry lied to you? Yeah. Like, no, we're going to tell the truth and you're going to view this through the lens of what's true for me. And just like I say, and is this normal? We're going to have our cake and our balanced hormones too, because, um, you know, as you and I were talking, I was just in Paris. I very much adopt the French way of living in terms of pleasure is necessary yes. for a balanced, happy life. Okay. Yes. We talked about diet. We talked about exercise. The last thing I want to say is sleep. If you are not getting quality sleep, then I don't care how good you eat. It is going to be an uphill battle. So there, the piece I want to talk about in Is This Normal, I have a whole diagram. You can see the insulin resistance, the inflammation, the anovulatory cycle. So not ovulating, all of that can occur if you're not sleeping well. You want to hone in on melatonin. Melatonin Everybody's like, great, sleep hormone, don't get jet lag. Uh, it protects your ovaries. If you are struggling with infertility and you are 35 plus in my clinic, we're going to bring melatonin in as a way to support ovarian health. Melatonin is an antioxidant. It also protects the brain. Now, in terms of research of like, oh, do we have great research on like, if we take melatonin long-term or anything? No, we don't. But what we do know is that melatonin is so potent of an antioxidant that those people who are night shift workers who have low levels of melatonin, they have higher incidences of cancer, ovarian dysfunction, brain disease, all of these things. And so with PCOS, with perimenopause, with every woman on this planet, protect your ovaries by getting good sleep. And the things that you do to protect your ovaries are actually gonna protect you for longevity. And I don't know about you, and I'd love to hear your opinion, but I'm very much of the mindset that if David Sinclair can be out there saying like, hey, based on my research, we don't have to die and our cells should live longer and they can remember, then our ovaries should be able to as well. And yeah. it makes no sense why it is that we live so much longer than even generations ago, but that we are still going through menopause and struggling with perimenopause when we do. We should be able to extend that lifetime. And I'm convinced it comes down to all of the things that we do to support our mitochondria and that every biohacker or health optimi optimization person or longevity expert, you know, whatever people are calling themselves these days, they're all talking about the same stuff to like make your cells work and go the distance. We should be able to do that with our ovaries as well. Amen, sister. I'm just sitting here nodding and smiling so big because you've just given us a, such a depth of wealth of knowledge. And, and what I love is you always bring the practical tips too. And you and also like, yeah, a little sugar is okay, but really, really do watch this thing. Like it is important. Glycemic index has everything to do with diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and cancer risk. So it's yeah. very real. We can't ignore that, but also pleasure is important. <laughs> so I love that. One thought I had when you were talking, you're talking about diversity of diet and the microbiome and all these things, you know, I love the gut. And recently I've been doing research on nitric oxide and some of the quotes mm -hmm. were that loss of hormones, loss of nitric oxide are really the core of aging. Well, nitric oxide is rich in things like leafy greens and beets and beetroot and all this nitric oxide is all about great sex, right? It is Yes. Okay. So I was so glad you're saying this. Cause I'm like, if you are struggling with an erection, whether yep. it's your clitoris or your penis friend, you are aging too fast. We've got yes. metabolic issues. Yep. We've got cardiovascular issues. I actually, in London, I was at the health optimization summit and they were like, talk about optimizing your hormones and your sexual health. And people were really shocked that I was spent so much time on insulin. I was like, let's talk yeah, about insulin yeah. because insulin resistance hates your clitoris. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, this, and, and here's the fact I bet I, I just read this. I did not know this till literally Sunday night. I'm doing the research to do a presentation on nitric oxide. Hemoglobin A1C is that goes up that literally binds uh, free nitric oxide, not nitric oxide. I didn't know that. I know me neither. So I thought, oh my God, that makes so much sense. Doesn't it? 
So basically, and insulin, and basically it, it, it creates more insulin resistance because the receptors and because of blood flow. So just so those of you who don't know, we're getting excited about this nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is naturally made by your body. It's made from fruits and vegetables. You can now take pills and things that are like beet juice. That's great. But truly food is a source of nitrates, which are converted in your microbiome, in your mouth to nitrites, which then your body uses to convert to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. It opens blood flow to the brain, to the heart, to the penis, to the clitoris, like to the, all the organs where we need this. So men and women, especially as we age most of the time, and especially if you're a man out there, we're not really talking to men today, but if you're a man, you're listening um, and your Viagra isn't working anymore, that means you don't have enough nitric oxide because that works based on the fact that you have nitric oxide and same with women. So this is such a core. And like I said, I was reading about the metabolic dysfunction with low nitric oxide, and it involves the fact that higher A1C is going to bind that up. So if your A1C is like eight or you're totally yeah. uncomfortable diabetic, you're going to have sexual dysfunction because you're binding up the nitric oxide. And let's just like, I want to just dovetail on that and say, we have recognized for decades that cardiometabolic issues lead to sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction in men. Well accepted. Medicine resisted this concept mm -hmm. in women being like, it has no bearing. It doesn't, it doesn't relate. And the reason is, is because the doctors are so poorly trained in clitoral anatomy. In fact, is this normal has three diagrams of the clitoris because the average medical textbook, the majority of medical textbooks don't even have one that wow. is actually representative. And I actually, I had, um, I, so I had an artist draw all these up for me and I had them do a cross section mm -hmm. showing like the corpus cavernosum yeah. and all of that. My editor was like, gone too far. Like, this is like <laughs> but what I was showing is that if I took a cross section of the yeah. penis and a cross section of the clitoris, it is the exact yes. same tissue. Yeah. Cause that as embryos, it was the same, same until yeah. testosterone came in and the penis is the one that differentiated from the clitoris. All yeah. right. Clitoris is always what was planned and, and testosterone and a gene on the Y chromosome. They decided otherwise and they went penis. So it is mind boggling to me why medicine, and I even still get people who push back on me, medicine regards this as like, this is true. This is fact for men, but women who have the same exact tissue who are saying I'm losing clitoral sensitivity. Yes. It's harder yes. to orgasm. Doctors are like, mm, you're just getting older. It's the way it is. And I'm like, okay, sexual function, pleasure, super important, yeah. but I've got alarms in my head because if you're saying that to me, I'm like, yeah. where's your insulin at? Yes. Like where, where is your blood sugar at? Yeah. Because if you, if your clitoris is feeling that effect, your eyes, your kidneys, yeah. your fingertips, like your heart, all of these other tissues are going to start feeling that effect as well. But where it may show up first is that place of yes. your body. And that may be the first place that you, you tune into because so many other things we're told are normal. Like you're starting to get old and your vision's changing. Yes. Okay, true, eyes change as we age. However, those can also be signs of serious cardiometabolic issues. Yes, yes. So just to repeat for those of you listening, men are women. And again, probably right now, majority of the audience is women. But if you're having- Yeah, but they live with men or they know men. So yes. it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Either way though, if you're having sexual dysfunction, like Dr. Jo Joellen Brighton said, she said, if this is a sign that there could be a vascular cardiovascular issue, it's literally the very first clue a lot of times for endothelial dysfunction or vascular dysfunction. So there's a way bigger importance than just sex here, although that is important, right? It, it's, it could be your health. Let's talk about menopausal women. Um, I'm yeah. one. I had um, I'll just briefly tell you. So I had a chemo at 25 for breast cancer. My period stopped for two years. My poor ovaries back then, but then they restarted. And then I had undiagnosed celiac and anemia, and I stopped my periods amenorrhea because I was undiagnosed celiac yeah. for two years in my 30s. Oh my and then they came back and my, I'm just like so happy with my little ovaries because they have just like fought and fought and fought. But then when I turned about 45, they started sputtering outside. I don't know. That's kind of early, but not super early considering what I've been through. So I am yeah. in plus. I'm not afraid to say that, but let's talk to those women out there. Um, what's average age, what symptoms, and then what do these women do about it? Because a lot of doctors don't know how to counsel them. And it doesn't mean you you have to have vaginal dryness or poor sex or poor libido or poor yeah. mental function or poor sleep. Let's talk about these women in menopause. Yeah. We would never accept that for men. Mm -hmm. This is what just really chafes me is that when you look at how women are treated and it is changing, but it's only People are like, so much has changed in medicine. I'm like, only in the last couple of years, because a hell of a lot of celebrities were like, we're not going to be quiet about this. We're going to start organizations. We're going to get loud. Uh, we're going to like make our own networks. And I'm like, 
man, like you see what the Kardashians do. And then you see what these other celebrities do. And I'm like, I feel so Spider-Man with great power becomes great responsibility. <laughs> like, Look at this change you can make. Cause like you and I were shouting it all day and the yeah. rest of medicine's like, whatever women suck it right. up. Right. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> let's talk about it though, because when, when we talk about menopause, like what exactly are we talking about? What's perimenopause? So it is normal to go through menopause at age 45. That's the youngest accepted age. And the average woman is going through it about 51. Okay. However, perimenopause can start seven to 10 years in advance. And so that means you might be 35 and you're starting to experience symptoms of hot flashes, the irregular periods and the periods stretching out beyond like seven days or more like being long or, <clears throat> you know, going, going beyond, like you used to be like 28 days and now you're like 35. That's happening more at the tail end of perimenopause in the early perimenopause. This is where like the hot flashes start to come up mood symptoms. So as our hormones change, they it's changing in the brain as well. We might notice weight gain, loss of muscle mass. We might notice that now we're starting to get like hair growing in yeah. places, un unlike the PCOS picture that was happening much earlier on the acne. That's so lame. Like who wants to right. be 40 with acne? <laughs> I, uh, I just laugh about it. Cause I, I went through that yeah. and I shared it online just a couple of weeks ago, thanks to like the hormones that I'm using. Yeah. So with that, there's a, this collection of signs and symptoms with perimenopause, itchy skin as estrogen starts to decline. When we get to menopause, menopause is a one day event. It arrives 12 months, 12 consecutive months of no bleed. So no ovulation, no bleed. You are now menopause. Tomorrow, the next day, you are now postmenopausal. Mm -hmm. Now with the hormones, people always think like estrogen is so problematic and estrogen's where we need to start. I sometimes see people saying like, if you're in perimenopause, you should start estrogen now. And I'm like, hold up. So this is where it can look more and more like that PCOS picture mm -hmm. that we talked about before. It's not PCOS, just so we're clear. But since people already heard that, just to link back in, in that when ovulation becomes more irregular, progesterone production becomes more irregular because the only way to progesterone is through ovulation. And so estrogen is unchallenged. As you're becoming irregular in your cycles, your symptoms may be related to estrogen, but at the root of it, it's because of what's going on with progesterone. And so if we're going to use hormone replacement therapy, progesterone is where we start. Yes. DHEA is another consideration. And it's important for everyone to understand this is a anti-aging hormone that our adrenal glands make. It starts as decline at 25, which is so lame because yeah. once we're in menopause, we need it because mm -hmm. if we turn DHEA into estrogen and testosterone. testosterone. And mm -hmm. so- during this time, during this phase, this perimenopausal phase, like we want to support the ovaries from producing progesterone regularly, ovulating, doing everything they can. When they when they don't got it in them anymore, that's where we look first at progesterone bioidentical. I really love oral uh -huh. because it gets metabolized, and its metabolites are what help you sleep, GABA. And feel less anxious. Exactly, going <laughs> yeah. to stimulate GABA in the brain. And so that insomnia, that inability. So if you wear trackable, like I do, um, <clears throat> so these wearable technologies are a great way for you to tune in what's going on. And what I'll say is that if you are tracking your cycle and you're looking at your body temperature and your sleep, and you are in your forties and you are finding body temperature, like body temperature goes up after ovulation because that's what progesterone does, but it's going a lot higher prior to your period and your sleep, you have more sleep disturbance. You're not getting as deep sleep. You're starting to have those issues. That's a sign that you are in perimenopause and that you might not even feel it yet. You might feel tired in the morning, but you're not <laughs> cluing into what's going on. And that technology may very well be cluing you in and showing you, okay, this is the pattern and this is what's happening here. Now, as you get into menopause, this is definitely a time that we should consider hormone replacement therapy. So estradiol, E2, for mm -hmm. the vagina, E3, estriol, that is lovely for vaginal dryness. And for anyone who has hesitancy around this, because there's a lot of doctors that are like, that's just going to give you cancer and it's horrible. So about 60% or more of women go into elder care facilities because of incontinence. They're, they're not able to make it to the bathroom on their own. They have to have somebody tending to them for that. We can prevent urinary incontinence 
by getting people with occupational therapists or pelvic floor therapists who work in that area and making sure that they have hormone stimulation to that tissue. Yes. Because estrogen isn't just about great sex, the ability to self-lubricate. Estrogen is why you're able to make the glycogen, the sugar that feeds the lactobacilli in your vagina that mm -hmm. keeps the pH moderated so you don't end up with BV, yeast infections, and even urinary tract infections. It also helps with the musculature and the tissue of the pelvic floor so that we are less inclined to be heading down the road of vaginal atrophy. atrophy. So thinning of the tissue, and this can be uncomfortable to walk or you wipe with toilet paper after urinating and you bleed. Mm -hmm. And all of that's gonna affect your, your urinary tract system as well. And so that's a reason to consider topical estri estriol E3. Mm -hmm. And this is the hormone of pregnancy. It is a weak hormone. It will get its job done down there, but it is a weak hormone. Estradiol is the one that is yes. a much more potent hormone. And that is one that I'm always like just topical friends, because it's when we take it orally that we see the increased risk of clots. And yep. the, so for everyone to understand, anytime estrogen goes up, clotting factors follow. This is why the pill, pregnancy, any oral estrogen therapy is going to be a risk for a clot. So stroke, pulmonary embolism. We, we don't, we don't want any of that stuff. So if you're afraid of that, that's something to understand uh, that we don't, we don't want to be going the oral route. So we talked a little bit about the estrogen and I don't want to like just sit here and preach from the pulpit, so to speak, but testosterone is another therapy that often gets overlooked. If you're doing DHEA, I don't recommend doing testosterone. And I never recommend doing DHEA without knowing your estrogen, your testosterone, how your enzymes- Where it's going, from. right? <laughs> exactly, because you might cause hair loss or you might cause acne yeah. and you don't want any of that. But with testosterone therapy, this is really important for women a lot of doctors, even doctors doing uh, hormone replacement therapy are like, women don't need testosterone. And I'm like, uh, we do, yeah, we do yeah. because it's important for our mood. If you find you're crying all the time, you lack motivation, you can't get up in the morning, you're losing muscle mass. You probably have testosterone problems and the libido will also be a problem. Yes. But notice I didn't start with the libido right, <laughs> because right. it's going to need a whole lot of other things going on than just libido if you have low testosterone symptoms. So that was a whole lot of information. The, the other thing I want to say, so I shared with you before we started recording, I'm going through IVF treatments. And I noticed during my pregnancies that I always have like great boundaries. And I just feel like I, I always talk about testosterone is like you wake up, you kick ass, you set boundaries yeah. and on this and going through IVF therapy. When I watch my, I'm not monitoring my blood. I watch my estrogen go up and I'm like, you know, people always say that like testosterone is like the alpha hormone. And I'm like estrogen, yeah. estrogen is the alpha hormone because I can tell you like you know, people had a lot to say about IVF. I'm injecting brain hormones that make yeah. my ovaries produce yeah. estrogen and build follicles. Huh? But my estrogen, man, my brain, I'm like, my brain has never worked so yeah. well. Yeah. My like, my ability to just be like, no, you're not going to talk to me like that instead of being like, you know, that woman thing. I right, know, right, right. Just me, but like being like, yeah. did I do something? Should I tend to this? Is this my <laughs> fault? I'm just like, no, 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 no. Like, this is not the way it is. I will not be talked to. I will not be treated like that. And I'm, I just like watch all of this, like observing. And I'm always like this N of one. And I'm like, man, that is so much. I, I feel like this is part of the conspiracy of why we, why they don't want to give women estrogen. Yes. Is yes. Because, my goodness. We are brilliant. We are powerful. Yeah. We are all the things that this world needs us to be when we have yeah. estrogen, yeah. but complacent is not one of them. I love that you say that all my life, my sister and I have been prone to PCOS. I don't think I've been full blown because I didn't have a lot of clinical symptoms, but um, knowing that my testosterone has always been okay. And even postmenopausal, that has not been my issue, but estrogen was the big thing that I noticed. And just like you said, all of a sudden, lack of motivation, lack of like a uh, clarity planning uh, executive function. That was all I actually realized uh, that's not testosterone because my testosterone was normal. It was no, no, totally. Right. So I love yeah. that, you say that because I really realized too, I'm like, wow, this estrogen is really important. And because of my history of breast cancer, I was always more careful. I want yeah. to speak to that. Of course, I'm 20 years out. So, um, but so many doctors are afraid, even with a history of breast cancer. Now use this under, use your, you need to talk to your physician about this, but Absolutely. it is safe to replace estrogen in the right cases. When you're doing transdermal, you're doing the right forms, even after breast cancer, if you're enough years out, the studies support this. 
and mm-hmm. and I don't and want it can her be protective. Yes, it yes, especially when you use it with progesterone, or yeah, because you're dividing cells and then you're um, yeah. differentiating. So I want to say the amount. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say the amount you have to use to get yeah. symptom relief is yeah. so little. Yes. And it, yes. you know, um, no, no shade to Suzanne Summers. Because she was trying to, she was doing the best she could with the information that she had, like we all do. Um, but that whole protocol that people were doing, I would never mess with that. I had patients Agreed. coming to me being like, I want to have my period again. And I'm like, you have a period because you ovulate. I can't give you any hormones to make you ovulate again. Like Mm -hmm. if I could, if I discovered that, like, Oh Mm -hmm. my goodness. Like I'd be telling everybody, but like you menstruate because you ovulate, I can't make you ovulate again. So just giving you enough hormones to make your uterus bleed. Like what are, what are we doing there? That's not, that's not in harmony with the way that things were designed. So you don't need much. I mean, I have patients on very, very little amounts of of estrogen and I'm always surprised at how good they feel like on so little. And I'm like, if it works for you, let's go. And, you know, in the case of autoimmunity, we see autoimmunity gets a lot worse in menopause as well, because we lose that estrogen that helps modulate the immune system. And so with that, that's, you know, and I will also say insulin makes us, excuse me, estrogen makes us sensitive to insulin as well, which we know blood sugar regulation ties in to immune system function. But there are women who that are struggling with MS, who are struggling with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, who are struggling with all these things that, I mean, rheumatoid arthritis and Graves' disease, oftentimes they'll see doctors be like, no, you can't have any estrogen, but a little bit done just right and well monitored in that patient can actually help their symptoms immensely. And what what do we really want here? We want quality of life. Like we want, we want every single woman in that wise woman phase able to pass on that wisdom. I know I do. Yeah, no, great, great summary. And I, I've always said here again, because I've had breast cancer, I can speak from that perspective and I don't have to choose, but if I had to choose between breast risk and brain risk, I'm going to choose my brain. <laughs> um, so even in that, it's we a hard it. choice, right? But yeah, it's, yeah again, yeah. and I, I, I'm not, we don't have to choose. There are safe ways for post-breast cancer patients when they're far enough out with the right topical doses, low doses that are absolutely safe. Um, of course, with your doctor's input, right? Um, and being monitored getting mm-hmm. the right yes. testing yes. and having the methylation yes. support that we yes. know protects you against DNA damage. That's, I think this really comes back like full circle to what we were talking about with the pill. Like you can use the pill, you can use hormone replacement there, but you can use these interventions, but we have to individualize it and we have to support you beyond that. Yeah. And that has been such a disservice that modern medicine has done is like, here's a pill. It's going to yeah. fix everything. Yeah. And I'm sorry, friend, that I can't give you something to fix everything because like, I know that'd be super easy, but the choices you make every single day, that is the major mover in medicine. Medicine, and that's what makes pharmaceutical interventions work better and have less side effects. And yes, you do have that much power. Love it. What a way to end with the empowerment of women. And I love, gosh, we could talk a whole other hour, but everybody, the big thing is grab a copy of her new book, Dr. Brighton. This is brilliant. It's, it's so great because it's one of those you can keep um, next to you and literally like reference it when you need help, when you have questions, if you need dietary, it's all in here including the diagrams. <laughs> so love, love, love it. Love that you have put out your great work in the world. Where can people find you? Where can they find the book? Give us a little bit of info about you. All right. So drbrighton.com, D-R-B-R-I-G-H-T-E-N.com. That's my main hub where you will find tons of free resources to support your hormones. The book is there as well as all over in bookstores. And uh, you can also find me on social media. So at Dr. Jolene Brighton, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, threads now. <laughs> no, <right? laughs> or Facebook. I know. I'm like, I, I tagged you the other day. Someone was like asking me about mold. And I was like, uh, Dr. Jill Carnahan is oh, thanks. To talk to you about this. And I was like, thank God she's on threads because I know, right? It's I always like- feel like <laughs> when I want to give somebody a resource or a referral. If they're not on social media, I'm like, uh, I'm going to give this person your name. And then, and then yeah. they're not going to, they're probably not going to search it. Right. They need this help now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Well, everybody go out, check a copy, get, get your copy of this book. So worth having it next to you. And thank you, Dr. Brighton, for your work in the world. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you for that estrogen power. Um, it's great to talk to you today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. So good seeing you. And thank you to your audience for uh, listening to us go off about hormones and how to help yourself.